I'm Dr. Ben Newman. I'm a coronavirus researcher with 25-ish years uh, experience uh, with these dumb little viruses. And I'm going to try to use that to answer your questions, which tend to be about COVID, because what else are we going to talk about? Yeah, but you can ask other things if you like, and I'll do my best. Um, all right. Uh, today's first question is actually a fairly old question. Sorry it's taken so long. This is from Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. I hope everything's going well where you are. Um, so this question is about a... Um, a particular person and about the Wuhan lab leak conspiracy. So let's just dive into that. It's something I've touched on in other videos, but doesn't hurt to have it all framed in a particular way and collected together, I think. Yeah, uh, it's another another chance that somebody will stumble across this and say, oh, you know what? <laughs> oh, I get it now. OK. <laughs> So the question is, uh, starts out, I just watched an interview with Dr. Nicholas Petrovsky, and I think he goes by Nikolai Petrovsky in the information that I can find, but that would be a normal thing, yeah, to uh, anglicize a name. Uh, he's working at uh, Flinders University in Australia, and Flinders is cool because the Flinders range is where you find uh, some of the earliest large body fossils of animal-ish things and they're like creeping bath mats and weird headless possibly swimming things and a whole bunch of worm-like stuff just fantastic fossils that's not what we're talking about today we're talking about um yeah the lab leak uh idea so uh this person um, is on something called the Bolt Report, which I haven't heard of, but uh, I'm assuming this is one of those sort of fringe uh, news things. And it's still up on YouTube, so it hasn't been knocked down as um, uh, nonsense yet, which either means it's not or we haven't got there yet. Uh, quite often I delay too long in responding to these, and the person has already been expunged from the Internet. Um, but that has not happened yet in this case, so good, yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Petrovsky um, uh, has a lot to say about uh, whether or not pangolins could be a potential source of the virus. My problem is that Dr. Petrovsky hasn't done any work on this and hasn't done any work particularly connected with this field. He does sell himself as a uh, COVID-19 vaccine developer on some site that I uh, pulled up, but um, I, I think maybe that's in development or uh, he's got a company or he's working on something or he has an interest or his mom made him a really cool certificate and he's got it, you know, up there on the fridge with a couple of magnets. Either way, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, based on his uh, CV, it looks as though he has experience in vaccine research and he's published recently enough and in what appear to be reasonable journals i have not looked through the papers but um it, it looks like it is probably science i think beyond reasonable doubt uh, this appears to be a genuine uh person with uh some science experience but no coronavirus experience and one other factor there is that oh about almost four weeks ago now there was the once every three years, not triennial, triannual, I don't know, coronavirus conference. And this is where if you're working on coronaviruses and you are, um, this is where you show, show and tell, <laughs> just, just like kindergarten, but with a lot more PowerPoint. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I do not remember seeing his name amongst the guests or presenters. And so I think he may have an interest, but I, he is not um, uh, what I would call a coronavirus expert. So he has opinions, and that's fine, but they are general scientist opinions, not person who knows what they're talking about in this specific case opinions. Yeah. So there'd be some intuition that might cross over, but uh, yeah. The rest of the stuff, grain of salt, I would say. <laughs> Um, uh, in the video, he comments a couple of times, actually, that uh, his feelings have been hurt. Um, uh, he says that anybody who uh, promotes the lab leak hypothesis that it came from a lab from experimentation or whatever and not a natural infection is uh, paints as a bad scientist and a conspiracy theorist. I think there's enough reason to suggest that he's probably an okay scientist, but conspiracy theorist uh, may be a little closer. Uh, yeah. 
who knows? Yeah. <laughs> the wonderful people I've met as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, boy, yeah, it's getting to be a long, long list. Um, anyway, uh, his idea is that uh, it's um, not bioterrorism, but uh, an experiment gone bad and somehow got out of the lab despite all these safeguards and somebody messed up. He's uh, eager, it seems, to point a finger. He's just not sure exactly who to point it at. And I, I get that. But um, this is a thing that is talked about. What's the origin of uh, SARS-CoV-2? That is something that is widely talked about inside the coronavirus community and outside the coronavirus community. But it's two very different conversations, as I found out at the uh, symposium. Inside the community, the talk centers around people who are doing experiments and they're saying well all right what viruses do we have and so there's this list of uh, all the viruses that people have found and it's a very long list there are a lot of things that the uh, average consumer of covid news would not <laughs> have uh, run across and of these which ones are closest which ones are closest in certain key parts everybody's got their own hypothesis which parts are the most important tends to center around the spike. That's the one that we understand best what it's doing. And so we tend to look for things with a similar spike. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the pangolin viruses and there's some bat viruses uh, that are also candidates. Um, the interesting thing here, which he may not know if he wasn't at the conference, and I think this may have been recorded before the conference. I didn't find some of this out until the conference, um, was that there are so there are several strains of bat coronavirus that are fairly close but they start at about a thousand mutations different and then they go out from there you know 1500 2000 3000 um mutations different so none of them is that close but we do have a source for some of these other viruses so we know that they came from a particular bat on a particular day harvested by a particular person so these close but not quite viruses break down into viruses that came from bats and viruses that came from pangolins. Pangolins, the spike's closer, the virus is farther. Bats, the whole virus is closer, but the spike's not quite as close. And that's where your average outsider, that's as far into the mysteries of this as that person is going to get. But there are a lot of papers that are published about this. People will take the spike out and see, does a spike from this bat virus let, the, let something like a virus into a, uh, a human cell, a bat cell, a pangolin cell, a cat, dog, buffalo, whatever cell. And so from those experiments, we actually get an extra layer of detail. The viruses everybody points to as potentially uh, tying the Wuhan Institute of Virology to uh, uh, the outbreak, I think wrongly, uh, are two that are called the WIV, and I believe they're WIV 14 and 16. I may be misremembering the numbers on those. But the WIV is Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, and so that's where uh, those are from. They are not the closest ones. Uh, the uh, RATG uh, 13, I believe, again, don't quote me on the number, is the closest one. That one comes from a bat. Uh, the WIVs also come from a bat, but um, uh, they were, reco they were uh, recovered rather from a particular cave uh, uh, back in 2012 or 2013, so a while ago. And those are the ones everybody points to because, well, it's a similar virus. It's in the right place. So, you know, it must be. Uh, but there are a lot of viruses out there and it's not certain enough. Interesting thing is that those WIV strains have a spike that actually is not very good at entering human cells. It's somewhere between not functional and barely functional. So there's no real way that those viruses can jump over and become human infecting viruses in anything like a natural accidental uh, kind of way. Um, but the viruses that look as though they probably started as bat viruses and went through pangolins, all the viruses they pulled out of those pangolins do seem to be able to get into human cells. So I don't know that it's actually a pangolin. Uh, the odds that the first stone you flip over is the right stone in a field full of stones, I think those odds are fairly slim. But pangolins would not have been on my radar. There just happened to be a study published around the same time somebody happened to look for them, and there happened to be traces of SARS-like viruses in these pangolins. They were 
just checking <laughs> to, just to check. Yeah, that's what uh, a lot of science is. You, you check something and occasionally you find wonderful, amazing things uh, that you weren't looking for. So, yeah. Um, is there anything to it? I don't see any particular evidence pointing to the lab leak. I think that is nonsense. Um, and honestly, that didn't come up once that I heard in the discussions online or the actual presentations or the live questions after the presentations. And so I, I think it is something that is talked about outside the field, but nobody inside the field, which are basically the only people that are really close enough to have firsthand experimental knowledge of what's going on. I, I don't think uh, any of them uh, considers this a realistic possibility. I realize I'm talking for a lot of people there, but you think it would come up at a meeting like that, and it did not. So um, this is uh, something that seems plausible in inverse proportion to how close you are to actually uh, having done the work and understanding what the work is. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's how it looks. So uh, yeah, Dr. Nikolai Petrovsky, um, saw that interview i don't think he is an expert uh in uh coronavirus evolution that doesn't appear to be an area where he has ever done any work don't believe he's an expert in um uh, spike function in terms of coronavirus entry and when you're commenting on things but you don't really know what you're talking about then i think uh, generally the quality of the comments is not as high as you might think it is. So I think he's a person with um, uh, some legitimate scientific background and an interest. And I think he's just, I, I think he's talking. And I think they're opinions, but I don't think they are like qualified opinions. I don't think they are sort of valid opinions. Yeah. Well, there we go. It's a long way of saying I, I think there's a lot of hot air there. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, uh, show me the data and I'll look at the data and uh, that's what is going to convince a scientist. And right now we've, we've just got a lot of talk and there are a lot of other possibilities that are, I think, more likely than this one. And I think the reason people are still attached to that is because it was brought up very early by people for other reasons, more like political reasons and... Uh, it's kind of like the founder effect, like um, when the first company that comes along in a field dominates market share because they were there first and it becomes harder and harder for anybody else to get in there. I think that happens with ideas, too. So this is a founder effect idea that wasn't particularly good, but it was early. So <laughs> there it is. Um, thanks very much. This has been a sorry, it's been very long, but uh, a rather long Ask Dr. Ben. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. It probably won't be the last one we have to deal with about the uh, Wuhan lab leak, but hopefully we can bring some more uh, actual uh, data and scientific papers into the conversation uh, in the next one because there's, there's a lot of work out there um, kind of swirling around this question and uh, some neat stuff that came out of the conference. So until next time, thank you very much.